Our next speaker is the mayor of Chicago. And there's three things I wanted to share with you. Number one, the City Club of Chicago is enormously grateful to him and his wife Amy for both visiting and speaking at Misericordia and Special Olympics events and encouraging everyone in the spirit of the City Club of Chicago to give back in the same measure they have received. Number two, the City Club of Chicago is very thankful to the mayor for helping raise millions of dollars for children and adults with special needs and intellectual differences. Our next, number three, our next speaker's frequent attendance at City Club of Chicago events, like today, and encouraging his leadership team to speak, like our speaker today and Commissioner Reefman and Lori Healy and others, is deeply appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Mayor. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to have to do a couple other things so I can kind of modernize that introduction, which was the same as the other one when Gene Jones was here yesterday about the housing on um, that effort. It's a crop. Yeah, I know. It's a, if a line works, use it, Jay. Okay. Uh, so I do want to say uh, I want to say a few things and give you guys a flavor. Sometimes people try to figure out what exactly does World Business Chicago do. Uh, this morning, uh, we announced uh, Blue Crew. It's our second company in 10 days that moved their headquarters from San Francisco to the city of Chicago. I think Gina, Dino uh, uh, are here, uh, and Adam. Just for the record, so everybody knows, uh, one's a Sox fan, one's a Cubs fan, so I told them we can hug it out. Um, but they've just moved their headquarters from San Francisco to Chicago, 100 employees. Uh, 10 days ago, we announced another company that had moved. Andy and I were just talking. In the last uh, five months, we've announced 4,000 tech jobs in the city of Chicago, either moving or expanding operations, <laughs> Google, other companies. And World Business Chicago, and then to give you one other kind of addition, Later on this afternoon, Andy and I will be sitting down in two separate meetings with two separate companies about the expansion and relocation opportunities here in the city of Chicago. And World Business Chicago does all the research, background, targeting, and focus for the blue crews of the world, the announcement, the Googles of the announcement. In fact, Andy was with me by my side when we went to see Ruth Porat in San Francisco, Northern California. And the announcement also the other day, uh, for the first time, the direct flights from Tel Aviv to the city of Chicago, that was on a trip to Israel that World Business Chicago had done. Andy was in the room with the CEO of El Al with me as we made that pitch. As I said jokingly privately to Andy, now I'm going to get myself in trouble. Getting direct flights from Tel Aviv to Israel under this Congress, that counts as dual loyalty, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I just had to get that off my chest. A little personal therapy for me. I just gave you markers, but there's something more important than that. Just take O'Hare as an example. Every part of the city has employees that work at O'Hare. It is an economic engine for the city of Chicago? Correct. But it is also a job engine for the city of Chicago in every neighborhood. And under Andy's leadership of World Business Chicago, we're not just a world-class city with a global presence but a global reach, and then we make sure that every part of the city of Chicago has a part in that effort. Making sure that when the contracts are at the city of Chicago at O'Hare, that different neighborhoods, different communities that have been locked out from that economic opportunity are included. She is overseeing what I call inclusive economic growth. And you cannot have a world-class city where only a few are prospering and, uh, and actually uh, prom being promoted, and other people can see all that progress, see all that opportunity, and then therefore be cut out from that effort. And so whether it's targeting a Google to expand their financial operation in the city of Chicago, or then encouraging uh, the airport of the city of Chicago to make sure that it's part of that effort. And I'll give you an example. This is pre-World uh, Business Chicago. When Andy was at the Urban League, and we were doing Red Line South, uh, Red Line South modernization, 
CTA partnered with Urban League to say, okay, we know what the minority and women-owned business targets are. That should be the floor, not the ceiling. We exceeded it at CTA, and then from the Red Line South, that became the new norm for all CTA projects, and that was because of her leadership at World Business Chicago. <laughs> Hundreds of bus drivers that never were bus drivers became bus drivers. Hundreds of small businesses that had been locked out of big co contracts got included. And hundreds of people that never were participatory in the trades got their first job as apprentice and journeyman on a project on the Red Line South, and then we're working on other CTA projects on the Blue Line, Red Purple Modernization, and the other work. She has brought a sense of the city of Chicago to World Business Chicago, so as we go around the globe, every one of the 77 neighborhoods is part of that effort. And this is from a person who started their career, whether it's as a lawyer in the U.S. Attorney's Office, Urban League. Mother way, this ain't church, okay? <laughs> right now, this is synagogue, and when church comes, you can cut up here and talk church, okay, Mother way? Right now, we don't have that at synagogue. This is a rabbi doing a sermon, Mother way, okay? But wherever I can do that, I only got 70 days left, what are you gonna do? And I can still run faster than Mother Way. <laughs> Although there's about five guys in here, if she says, sick them, they'll come after me. <laughs> On a serious note, at every step of her way, of her career, from Urban League to the U.S. Attorney's Office to World Business Chicago, Andy never forgot where she came from and the uniqueness of her opportunities, and that therefore she had a moral and a professional responsibility to ensure that other people could journey on the path that she plowed. She has really brought more than her professionalism, her heart and soul to World Business of Chicago. Please give a warm welcome to Andy Zock. Jeez, that was like super nice. <laughs> You always have to, you're never 100% certain what he's gonna say. Um, but he has been a real inspiration and, and a tremendous leader uh, because he lets me do, uh, bring my heart to my work. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, I do, I have so many friends in this room, um, I can't uh, t speak to everybody, but there's just a couple I have to recognize. First and foremost, my husband, Bill, um, who, <laughs> More than anything else, and most of you who know me know that this is a challenge, puts up with me um, and supports me in every single thing that I do. And he is way nicer than me, and so it's really helpful to bring him to things because people like to talk to him. Um, I also have to recognize I have two friends here from high school, and I did not go to high school here. We grew up in Rochester, New York. My two friends came from Western Illinois and uh, uh, Barrington, I can't even say it, Barrington, just to hear me speak. So Nancy Lloyd, Jill Bauer, you are friends for, I, I'm not gonna say how long, how many years. Thank you for being here. We were laughing, one of our friends from, our, from school is now running the school where we went to school at, which is like so hilarious that I have to go speak at the school just to see her in her office. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you a little bit about what W World Business Chicago does and also to talk about, particularly about how we're working to drive inclusive growth and, and support the city's strategy around neighborhood development. Um, and I'm thrilled to have that opportunity, but of course the other real reason that I'm thrilled to be here uh, at uh, the City Club is because I have been coveting one of those clear mugs, right? <laughs> I got like 80 of the blue ones, but I need a clear one, so I'm super excited. 
So um, let's talk a little bit about WBC. So World Business Chicago, I think as many of you know, is the city's economic development organization. Uh, we help recruit companies to come here, we help companies that are here expand, and we promote the city globally. Uh, and recently, a few years ago, we added the word inclusion. The mayor talked about inclusive economic growth. And I want to just touch for a minute on what that means, because I think in some instances, inclusion is kind of like the new diversity, right? It's just a word nobody really knows what it means. So I want to be very clear what it means to us. Inclusion means expanding economic opportunity. It means making clear that we're thinking about equity, mm -hmm. because when we bring jobs here, that's opportunity. When we help businesses grow, that's opportunity. But if that opportunity only stays in one portion of the city, if we can't figure out ways to better connect that opportunity to more residents, then we fail as a city. And so we're very focused on that there. Uh, at, at World Business Chicago. So, and our work really falls into three buckets. Core business development work, which is some of what the mayor talked about, recruiting companies, helping those that are here uh, grow. Our neighborhood work, which I'm gonna talk about, and our global strategic initiatives. We have a number of sub-initiatives, and we have a number of things that you all know, like a thousand jobs, or current, or M-Hub, or uh, uh, skills for Chicagoland's future, all of which started initially at WBC. We break our, we think about what we do in two buckets, activating local impact and our global reach. So let's talk a little bit about how we think we're activating local impact. So I'm just gonna give you just a few, a little bit of our business development work because we have been very successful. It is really easy, because when you read the paper, people talk a lot about the bad things about Chicago, the negatives, the, the things that they highlight the negatives, and we very rarely, we don't often talk about the positives. Why I love my job is I get to talk about the positives all the time to a lot of people, and let me tell you, we have a lot of positives, and those positives are drawing businesses here in record rates. So since 2011, We've had over, we've had 478 wins, and that means things that we've worked on at WBC where companies have come or expanded. 88,000 jobs and 58 corporate headquarters. Yesterday, by the way, that number was 57. Thank, welcome to Blue Crew and Gino and Adam who are here. Thank you, we're thrilled to have you. La Last week, that number was 56. That's the rate at which companies are, we are at top of mind uh, to companies about the idea of coming here. Number one in the country for six years in a row in corporate relocations and expansions. We have a lot of strong bones that attract companies here. They know their companies can thrive and also that their employees can thrive. We have a great business and client. We have an incredibly diverse economy in Chicago, one of the most in the country. No one industry has more than 14% of our GRP. We have a giant economy here in Chicago, $643 billion. We are the 22nd largest economy in the world. The mayor likes to say we almost made it into the G20, which he says is not that big a deal and you don't want to go to the meetings anyway, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, and we have a wide variety of industries, and if you look and you recognize uh, over 400 plus major corporate headquarters, oops, sorry, um, and you can see you know the brands, you know the companies, uh, and that's just continuing to grow and expand. I want to take touch for a minute on something that some of you may remember, but many of you may not have, be aware of, and that's the, strategic, the plan for economic growth and jobs, which is the strategic plan that WBC led under the mayor's direction shortly after he became mayor. And I wanted to touch on it because I think if you look at the strategies that came out of that plan, and the plan was uh, led by WBC, supported by McKinsey and Brookings. We involved our corporate members, our board members, our uh, civic community, the not-for-profit community. I served on the steering committee for the plan when I was the CEO of the Urban League, so it really was a very inclusive effort to look at the things that were our strengths from a data perspective and identify the areas where we really needed to be focusing from an economic development perspective. Uh, and I don't think that any of these things will surprise you. And just I just need to stop for one minute and also just, I should have mentioned this early on. Um, WBC, we have uh, our, we are really largely supported by our board. We have 94 board board members that represent the breadth and depth of the Chicago business community. Alex Gourlay from Walgreens is on our board, and we, Walgreens has been a longtime supporter. But you name the major company, they, are, they support us. And why do they do that? Because we don't 
They don't actually do a lot as board members. We use them sometimes when we're recruiting companies, but mostly they come because they believe that we have to continue to help Chicago grow, and their support helps us do that. Um, and so you see the focus areas here. None of them are particularly surprising. Advanced manufacturing and digital manufacturing, out of that came EBHUB, which is an incubator that drives, helps drive uh, support, provides a place for manufacturing businesses to grow and build their ideas. Also, DMDI, our advanced digital manufacturing site. We have transportation logistics, tourism. You know we had a real focus on Choose. Lori Healy, who is on Choose's board, is here. And you know what we're doing at the growth of our tourism industry. The two other areas that I just want to touch on are workforce development and neighborhoods. I'm going to circle back to that. Uh, but we recognized, even then in the plan, that we had to start focusing on how we're going to grow economic development in our neighborhoods. And we had to be thinking about workforce strategies if we're going to grow our economy. Uh, I want to touch on Chicago Next, which is one of our uh, initiatives, came uh, out of the plan. Chicago Next was a focus, a clear focus on our tech and innovation industry. Um, and the, for those of you who, who are engaged in that or are familiar with that work, what you know is that not that long ago, 2011, 2012, we had not much of a tech and innovation industry, and we really needed to focus on this. So what, at WBC, we looked at three, uh, two areas critically. One was capital and talent, and that was we've developed a Think Chicago program, and then we have a Venture Summit. Uh, and the third was creating a, a community. And then also you see up here, after uh, two years ago, we also started recognizing that our tech and innovation industry was not as inclusive as it needed to be. There were a number of women, minorities that were underrepresented. And so we got some funding from Blackstone to create an inclusive entrepreneurship program that focuses on expanding and engaging. If we support organizations that are helping to grow uh, underrepresented uh, people in the the tech industry as well. Um, and so this really is a precursor and a, a partner in P33, which many of you are familiar with, which is also committed to growing our tech and innovation industry. So let me just talk a little bit about how that's working, because it's important. I love this slide. So I got to tell you why I love this slide. I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, started, as, started my career as a prosecutor uh, back in the day before I could just pick a, pr press a button, something would come up on a screen. But I love graphic exhibits because I love a picture is a thousand words, right? And this picture gives you graphically what's happened in our tech and innovation industry since 2000, really since 2000, if you can see how exponentially it's grown, just since 2010. But here's, let me give you some specifics. In 2011, we had zero incubators here. Zero. We have well over 200 now. The number one university-affiliated tech incubator in the world is here in 1871. We had zero in 2012. We have, and we are growing, the mayor, uh, see this is the other thing that you learn when you work with Mayor Mayor Allen, don't tell him anything from your speech right before he gets up. Um, so I turned and I go, you know, we have a whole bunch of tech jobs. So he told you, this mayor told you, we have, four, <laughs> since December, uh, we've announced about 4,000 new jobs in tech, both small and large, um, and tech and also tech-related jobs. So that number also includes Google's finance organization that is coming here. Because in a, when those companies grow, right, they create not just engineering tech jobs. They create HR and administrators and finance people. And so those jobs are growing as well. But the other thing I want to touch on, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is this is also not just happening on the near west side. It's also happening on the south side. So if you look at our few universities that are located, UIC, IIT, University of Chicago, they are going to add capacity for 6,000 computer and science and engineering students in the next few years. In the, also in that space, we've got new incubators, Polsky, Kaplan Center, the Diver Discovery Partners Institute. On Motor Row, we have a whole growing space of, of co-working spaces happening down there. We are also expanding. So it's happening not just on the near west side because we have that capacity to grow. And that's one of the things that excites me about what's happening in our tech and innovation space. So you guys came at a perfect time. Um, now let's just talk a little bit about what we do at WBC when it comes to global, our global reach and our global initiatives. 
So the mayor, we've taken the mayor since he's been mayor 10 times to 10 different uh, markets, um, China, Mexico, Israel, Italy, Canada, Germany, UK, Ireland, France, and Japan. Um, and just so you know that those trips are not just, the, you like to think we're boondiggling. We are, because you don't do that with Mayor Emanuel, by the way. Um, you talk to everybody. And out of those meetings came some very unique partnerships, including a partnership with China, the Com Department of Commerce, the Mission, uh, Ministry of Commerce in China, eight different Chinese cities. We have an, a, an economic development agreement uh, that, and we just renewed that. That was in 2013. It was the first time ever that had happened. We just renewed it last summer. Um, and if you think that that's just a, uh, an agreement, our investment from China has increased every year since those five years. And just to give you an example of every time you know you hear that phrase FDI, and everybody's like, what does that mean besides foreign direct investment? Let me tell you what that means real time, real life for people. Two weeks ago, we opened a plant called, run, built by a company called CRRC, which is a rail car company on the, in the far south side, 135th and Torrance, on the southeast side of the city. That company is going to build the rail cars for this, oops, sorry, for the CTA. I gotta put my, stop. For the, for the CTA and is going to create, created hundreds of construction jobs to build the plant and it's going to create hundreds of permanent jobs for workers on the south side. And that first group of employees, by the way, very diverse. If you saw on my LinkedIn page, just, came, just went there in China right now, learning the, tech, the technology to build those cars. That's foreign direct investment, literally on the south side, creating jobs for people who live in Chicago. So that. Chicago's been number one in foreign direct investment in the country for the last six years in a row. But in addition to that, we're also positioning Chicago as a leading global city on policy matters. The mayor hosted a, a meeting uh, last December, or December 2017, of all mayors from all over the world on climate change. It was right after the US stepped out of the Paris Accords. And we said, you know what, cities, particularly large cities, can have an impact on climate change. And we brought 60 mayors from all over the world to come here and sign the Chicago climate change so that we can lead to say we are not going to stand down and turn away from this issue simply because our national government doesn't consider it a challenge this year. And that's how Chicago leads. Thank you. Oh, I see, I'm like two slides. You're like, what is she talking about? Sorry, two slides behind. Somebody give me a clue, like, so forward. Uh, uh, we also run the Sister Cities program at World Business Chicago, and uh, we have the largest World, uh, sorry, Sister Cities program in the country. We just added our 29th Sister City uh, a few weeks ago when we were in uh, Paris and the, the mayor of Sydney was there. Uh, and we now have a sister city on every occupied continent in the world. Um, and that becomes important because while sister cities is, is about cultural exchanges and making and really building relationships culturally, it also reminds people when I'm recruiting companies globally that everyone has a home here. Over 500,000 pe people of our resident, uh, 500,000 of our residents here are born in another country. We speak over 140 different languages in this city. And we want companies to know as we become more and more global and they're recruiting talent globally, wherever your people come from, wherever you come from, whatever community you need, whatever council general you need, we have a home here in Chicago and we have people, we have a community here that we're committed to welcoming and Sister Cities helps us do that. We also have a tremendous program that we've built over the last four years where we're connecting our young people because it is so important for our young people to understand that it's a global world and that people all around the globe have the same issues and concerns that they do. And so we bring 15 young women from our sister cities and we take 10 women from our Chicago public schools and we put them together for a week, they problem solve, they meet leaders here, and with, with the wonders of modern technology, they become friends for life. And they build a network of support around the globe. Uh, and, that's what, and that's a really powerful tool, it doesn't take much, um, and we're really excited about the opportunity to do that. 
So I want to talk now for a little bit about what we're doing at the neighborhood level. And then I want to talk about how that fits into what the city's doing and the impact that it's having. So uh, uh, we have a group uh, led by the fabulous Bernita Johnson Gabriel. And I do, that reminds me, I do want to just take a minute and recognize my World Business Chicago team that is here. Please wave your hands in the air. And uh, we developed, this group came directly out of the plan for economic growth and jobs that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, and really focuses in three big areas. Targeted, really focused business development. We talk to businesses about, hey, maybe you don't have to be downtown. Maybe you can put your facility in Inglewood or Bronzeville or Pilsen. We just looked at a beautiful space in Pilsen that we're going to start marketing. Um, and we're also doing some very specific work. We're working. We're going to create, to create, build a business on the west side that's going to support the hospital, anchor hospital institutions that are over there. They're going to take all their laundry business and we're going to build an employee owned, uh, partially employee owned and hospital owned laundry that will create jobs, will teach entrepreneurship, uh, and it's going to be located on the west side. So it's based on a model all of the... <laughs> out of uh, Cleveland, the Cleveland hospitals did that. Um, we're also working in the workforce area, and we're not a workforce provider, but it, it really is making sure that all these jobs that we're talking about, that we're creating pathways into these skilled jobs uh, for people and helping employers think through how they do that. One of the things that is really terrific about WBC and very unique is that we are at the nexus of public, pub, public Right? We work with the mayor's office very closely, corporate and business, and community. And there's really no other organization that can pull all those three things together. So we're working with, uh, again, this, this first one's with our hospital anchor institutions to build a program, because here's what's happening to a lot of people these days. We've lost, as you know, decline in our middle class. And the challenge is getting people from hourly wage jobs into better skilled jobs. And there's a role for employers to help them do that. And so we're working with our hospital institutions. Or we've built a, co a program where the hospitals are taking hourly wage employees. They're using their tuition dollars that many of you already have to fund those employees going to Malcolm X to become medical assistants. And they're committed to hiring those employees when they finish that program back at the hospitals. So imagine what that means in terms of connection with your employees, but also opening pathways for people that didn't realize they could have that pathway from the employer. And we're, what, the goal is to make this pilot work and then bucket it for, for all kinds of things, like entry-level IT, entry-level project management. But the, engage the employers to help their people who are in hourly wage jobs move to another level. Uh, we also have a program called CASE that works with large institutions to help them hire or use smaller neighborhood-based businesses for procurement purposes. Um, we have, we're about to launch a platform called Chai Biz Hub that's gonna connect local businesses to services so they don't have to run around and figure go to every different place every time they need something. They'll have one source, one-stop shop. Um, and we also have a program where we're helping contractors um, get financing to cover their smaller contractors often have real challenges, particularly on private jobs, getting the financing they need to pay for the job before they actually get paid. Um, so these are just a few of the things that we're doing, but the idea here is what can we do as WBC to better use the resources that we have working with the business community to help local neighborhood smaller based businesses. And that then fits into the city's broader neighborhood development strategy. So I'm just going to take five minutes to walk through that and what it's hap and the impact that it's having. Because I think too often what you hear is, and you've heard a lot of this in this mayoral race, is we have to invest in the neighborhood. We have to invest in the neighborhood. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're investing in the neighborhood. Not only are we investing in the neighborhood, we're doing it in a way that's strategic, and we're doing it in a way that is starting to have an impact. So. The neighborhood economic development strategy, and again, this is not, this is a piece of it. Um, this is work that we've been developing at the city for some time under the mayor's leadership with my partner, David Reifman, over at the Department of Planning. Um, and really, but thinking through how we do things. And there's four key prin principles that I just want to touch on today. One is tying organic growth to inorganic growth. And by that, I mean very simply, we have parts of our city I don't have to do a lot right now. I just have to go, look, this is a fabulous area. Let me tell you what's going on. And companies will come. But we have parts of our city where you have to do a little bit more. 
And even then, sometimes it's a little harder. So we really need to figure out how we can tie, and we've done some things to do that. We also have to leverage our city assets. We have assets in places that they don't need to be. Um, and we can use that to create resources to do investment in the neighborhood. We also, we had a bad habit of kind of dropping in an investment in the neighborhood. We go, look, here, we built you a library. And then we'd do a press conference and we'd leave. Um, and people were engaged in what was happening. And that is, makes it very hard to have sustainable neighborhood development. Um, and the last piece is just working together. We can't do the city, government, WBC, we cannot do anything alone. So on the idea of tying inorganic, organic growth to inorganic growth, the main piece there is our Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, with many, which many of you know, but I'm surprised, always surprised to find out how many people don't know what it is. So the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund is very simply, if developers pay density payments to increase their density when they develop downtown. So it's all about taking development in areas where it's happening uh, in an area. We expanded that area. We also increased the amount of the density payment that people made. And then we and took that money and instead of putting it into buildings, into plazas and nice things downtown, we put it 80% of it into a fund that goes directly to businesses on the southwest and southwest sides. So far in the year and a half, about a year and a half, two years that it's been up and running, $12 million to 90 different businesses who have created, they've expanded, they've opened second sites, flower shops, accountants, barbers, restaurants, the kinds of businesses that all of you have in your neighborhoods that you need to have a neighborhood thrive. And we're taking literally, so when McDonald's opened, they opened their new offices, $4 million of that, from that went directly into the neighborhood fund, directly into the neighborhood. And that, um, and that, and what that does is it's, it's sustainable, it will, as long as our growth goes, and it, and it ties our interests together, right, in a way that's key. We also have an initiative called Retail Thrive Zones that ties commercial corridors on the south and west sides and is, is uses TIF dollars, which again, takes the growth from tax revenues and puts that back into the neighborhoods. Okay, I'm taking too long. I'm getting the finish it up look. So I will, quickly. Um, but just a couple other pieces that I think are really important. We're leveraging city assets. So the, to just, just, and I'll just use one example, but the others are here uh, because this is my favorite, as David knows. Um, so 2FM, our maintenance facility, was in the North Branch, big, giant maintenance facility in an area of the city that was growing, really, and begging for real development. We don't need to have a giant maintenance, old maintenance facility there. So we sold it for over $100 million. Um, and we took that money and built a new maintenance facility in Inglewood. We just opened it about a month ago. It's beautiful. Construction jobs, 200 people coming in and out every day to work in Inglewood that weren't there before. And guess what they are going to need? They're going to need a place to buy, their, to, go, to buy their snack at lunch and to buy, to shop and to do their cleaning. And so it's going to drive the commercial development we hope to do across the street. We also use that money to invest in the new high school in Inglewood that's coming, that's going to consolidate and bring better educational resources to the students of Inglewood. We also use that money to buy the property for the police and fire uh, safety academy that's going to go on the west side that is also bringing economic development to an area that hasn't been invested in. All of that came from growth on the north side and we pushed it directly into projects in the neighborhood. And that's happening again and again uh, on these investments. So again, I won't go through all of these examples, but um, this idea of before you kind of launch into a neighborhood, maybe you should talk to people. So before we built the Whole Foods in Inglewood, Whole Foods and the city spent a lot of time working with residents in the community to say, this, this company's coming. Let's make sure you're ready for the jobs. By the way, if you have a business that could sell into Whole Foods, we're going to do a fair for the businesses. 40 business, locally based businesses went into put, put items on the shelves in that Whole Foods. And several of them have now moved on to Whole Foods around the country, right? So it wasn't just we're building a store. 
We're building an asset for you in the neighborhood. Um, and then because Whole Foods was there, Starbucks came, Chipotle came. We're using the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund to hopefully build a brewery across the street. Um, and so additional neighborhoods coming. But none of that would have happened without the engagement of the community. And all of those projects that are there, we talked, the community has been deeply engaged. And the hatchery, which is a food incubator in Garfield Park, across the street is a neighborhood market where they, and it's part of a gardening cooperative. They're now cooking in the hatchery. Rick Bayless is also now opening up, running a program in the hatchery to teach students from the west side about skills and careers in the food industry, in the, in the restaurant industry. Again, we didn't just put a thing there. We said, we're going to bring you in. So let me just take, talk really briefly about what's happening with those investments. So these are some of the investments just in Pullman. So we have a method plant. We put a Gotham Greens on top of it. We have a Whole Foods distribution center. So you can see a series of investment there. Let me tell you, show you now. So the uh, CNI, Chicago Neighborhood Initiative, and, and the Metropolitan Planning Council did a study about what's happening in Pullman. And here's what you see. The, the uh, number of jobs in the neighborhood has gone up 40%. Home values are rising 136%. And equally important, in the area around the investment, crime and violence is dropping significantly. So this is... So because apparently, because I've talked too long, and, and I think I'm going to get hurt here in a minute, um, I'm not going to go through something, but I just, I'm just going to go through briefly. But I just want you to know, look at these neighborhoods. Bronzeville, um, where, and I'm really sad that I can't talk about the Rosenwald. Well, OK, I'm going to talk about the Rosenwald in Bronzeville. <laughs> just this one thing. Because it's so amazing. Because, I, because you, you just need to understand the difference these investments can make. So the Chicago Urban League is on 45th in Michigan. The Rosenwald Apartments was on Wabash and 40, between 47th and 46th on between Michigan and Wabash. It was built by Julius Rosenwald, the guy who built Sears. Um, it was meant, it was a housing development for middle class African American families. It was beautiful when he built. It was not so beautiful when I was at the Urban League. In fact, it was empty and it has been empty, it had been empty for decades. There was a forest growing on the inside of this building. So well, imagine what, how you feel about your neighborhood if you have a building that takes up an entire city block that's empty, it's scary, it's dark. So I was like on a mission. I was like, we've got to do something about this Rosenwald. And because of the leadership of the aldermen, the CHA, private investors and developers, that building has been redeveloped. It is now affordable housing, senior housing, and on the first floor on 47th Street, there's businesses there. There's a coffee shop. There's a tech business in there. It's like every neighbor should, hit, should have, and it is driving investment on 47th Street in Bronzeville. That's what we do. <laughs> So that is happening all over the city. It's happening in Inglewood. It's happening in Woodlawn. It's hap where we just opened the first full service grocery store in 70, no, 70 years? 70 years. 40, 40 years. It was a really long time. Since the 70s, which is 40 years. Sorry. But a long time. Can you imagine? And on the west side as well. So for all my west side people, I didn't forget you. But it's happening. And what, it, what this tells you is that when we invest in our neighborhoods, we can bring crime down, we can bring neighborhoods back. We have a lot more work to do. I do not mean to suggest to anyone that we are done, but let me leave you with three facts. First of all, none of this would have happened. We have a unique thing here in Chicago. We have an incredible commitment from our business community in civic growth and investment, time and time again. Millennium Park, for those of you, when I first moved to Chicago, was a big hole in the ground, a big, ugly hole in the ground. And it would not have happened but for the business community's leadership with the city to make it happen. It happens time and time again. Every investment I talked to you about came with the support of the, the business community. We're doing mentoring programs for thousands of children here that's being supported by the city and the business community. 
the, the district, the um, strategic decision support centers, which is changing the way the Chicago Police Department is policing and bringing violence down, are being supported by the city and the business community. It is a very special thing. Any, all of you who have national companies, when you bring your partners here, that you come and they talk to you and they go, wow, that's what you do in Chicago? We don't have that wherever I am, fill in the blank. It is very special and we have to continue it, which gets me to point number two. We have to continue to support making Chicago a place where businesses will come and they can thrive and their employees can thrive. Continuing, yes, it's worth to Continuing to support economic growth and thinking through all of the policies we create to make sure that we are welcoming and growing this city is critically important because if we don't do that, we don't have the revenues and the interest to do the rest of it. And finally, we have to make sure that when we do that growth, that we're making sure that we are thinking about inclusion, about everyone, about how can we make sure that the economic opportunity that we are bringing to the city impacts every citizen. Our vision at World Business Chicago, World Business Chicago is that every citizen can prosper. And we are committed to doing that, and we have to be committed so that we can t reject and get rid of this narrative of two cities, one city, one Chicago, where we can all grow and thrive. Thank you very much. Standing O, it doesn't happen here every day at the City Club, let me tell you. And um, wow. So in case you missed a few of the items that uh, Andy talked about, uh, we live stream this program and we also do a podcast with uh, WGN Radio that will be on um, just as soon as I, we leave here, I go over to WGN and we work on the podcast. So it'll give you an opportunity to catch up with everything. Bill, thank you for coming down here today. Thank you for having me. We're glad to have you. You know, later on tonight, when Andrea gets a chance to relax, if she ever does, you know, maybe a, a rainbow cone or visit over to Top Notch there in your neighborhood, okay? Anyhow, now we have time for um, a few questions. So if anyone has a question that they would like to ask of our speaker, just hold up your blue form. Ah, I see one way on the other side of the room. Alex, come back here. Don't go away. OK. Shows you what control I have over our staff. <laughs> Anyhow, we have a few questions while we're waiting. Shelby, there was one in the corner. There's one right here at the ComEd table. Oh, I wonder what the question is. <laughs> Thank you, Miles Berman. Uh, this is from Sheila Owens, I believe, who's with ComEd. She's a member of the City Club. Uh, thanks for making economic development about social and community impact. Here's her question. What are Chicagoland's assets making it a destination for overseas headquarters? And how is energy an asset? Don't mention the fact that the White Sox are not having a good spring. So, um Look, energy is an asset because we got plenty of it, right? Because we, and, and it's secure. We have an incredible network infrastructure. Um, and so we don't have a lot of issues with energy. And that in and of itself is an asset. And as smart as ComEd has continued to expand its smart grid, um, we just don't, it's not even, the cool thing is that it, it doesn't become, a, 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 it's not a negative. Like nobody comes here and goes like, how's your energy? You're like plenty of it, not a problem. Um, but that's, imp it matters, but it does, it does matter. The the other issue, the, probably the single most thing besides talent, and we do have incredible access to talent here that people care about, that we view as a selling uh, point for companies, is our connectivity. 
We have the country's number one most connected airport. We also have number two in the world, but also we've invested in the airport, right? I didn't, we didn't, I didn't talk about those investments, but we've made huge infrastructure investments, 85 billion. We just announced a new, the new terminal. We're building a new runway. When the runways are done, we'll have the capacity of, we'll have added the capacity of a third airport to O'Hare. We all know, because we live here, how fabulous it is to be able to fly direct to almost, now Tel Aviv, hallelujah, you do not know how many conversations we have had about Tel Aviv. I'm like, thank you, God. Um, and I mean that. Might have to go there and thank him again. Um, but, but to be able to fly anywhere direct, so many places direct in the world is huge for international companies. So that's probably our, our single most, besides talent. A lot of burdens are put on that uh, Lord up there, I'll tell you that. Okay, uh, this question here, oh by the way, we have someone in our audience that I would like to recognize because we hope that she will come and speak to us in the future at the City Club. Uh, the president of Chicago State University, I'll probably butcher her first name, Z. Z, Z Scott, right here. I was going to try for all 26 letters, okay. Uh, this is from Tim Egan, who's with the Roseland Hospital, the CEO, I believe. He wants to know if Roseland Hospital would be eligible to apply for support from the Economic Neighborhood Fund. Is a great question that I don't definitively know the answer to. David, do you know? Probably. I think we've done non for profits, so so we have done other non Tim, where are you? Raise your hand so I'm not talking into space. Over there. So we've done other non for profits. I don't hundred percent know, but I think the answer is yes. Okay. Um, this is from Pam Sinden with the NAACP Southside Branch City Club member. Pam, where are you? Right there. Uh, she wants to know if the candidates for mayor have expressed their commitment to World Business Chicago. So we've not had a World Business Chicago uh, conversation. I think both candidates for mayor understand very deeply that it's important um, to keep the economic engine that supports the city um, growing. And so, but, uh, and so I'm confident that we'll continue to have that support. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, DePaul University's uh, Dara Crowfoot. Her question is, are Chicago companies focused on reskilling their employees for, quote, hard to fill, end quote, open positions they have. What kind of help do companies need reskilling their employees? So that's a great question. As you said, we, we are working on that one pilot that I talked about. I think um, some companies are thinking about it, not all. I agree with you that it is a critical issue that we have to start addressing, uh, and many companies are. I mean, companies are also engaging in apprentice programs, internship programs, um, and so I think those things are happening as well. Um, but yes, I think finding ways to reskill and create opportunities for existing employees is going to become more and more important as the f war for talent continues. Because that, it's just going to get harder to find talented employees. And companies, I think, are going to turn to training those they have. Okay, thank you, Andrea. This is from Rebecca Fife. She's with Landmark Pest Management. She's not here. She submitted this via email. World Business Chicago's CASE program, C-A-S-E, -S has been very impactful for my firm, both through introductions as well as mentorship. What are the next steps for this important program? Um, so CASE is a program that I touched on briefly that connects small businesses uh, like uh, the person who asked the question, to larger institutions. Um, and so we've just really rebuilt that team. We're reconnecting with anchors. We're trying to add anchors uh, to that, so larger institutions to that and expand it. So it is. it can be by opening doors of access, which we all know when we're trying to develop business is such an important thing. We're hoping to create more opportunity for small business. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that we have a company that it, it has helped. 
Great. Um, this is from Locky Siap with the Chicago Asian Network City Club member. Locky, where are you? There you go, right over there. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges of WBC? How can community groups become more involved in providing support and solutions? So we have a team, uh, as I mentioned, of neighborhood team that's working with the community groups. So please make sure, uh, Bernita, wave, raise your hand. You connect with Bernita um, because we are working with community groups to get them up on our Shy Biz platform so that small businesses know that they're there, that they can have that support. Uh, and we're happy to come out and talk to you, anyone that you're working with about ways to grow their business. Okay, this is a question about the laundry project from Anonymous, but I think it's kind of an interesting question. Normally we don't ask unless someone is brave enough to put their name up here. And you're changing that rule? Before. Yeah, just because <laughs> this person wants to know how can existing companies support WBC project initiatives such as the Laundry Project? Oh, and of, of course when they offer support they go anonymous. Yep. Nice. Uh, <laughs> um, we, I mean, we will be eventually. We're going to be in a. We're not quite there yet. We're going to be in a fundraising phase for the laundry, um, and so we would love to have support. And so I think all you have to do is let me know that you're interested in supporting. Um, we'll have a, a more global fundraising phase for that when we. Right now, we're in the process of building the business plan, um, but um, we're happy to take offers of help. We do. We are a not-for-profit. I don't know if I mentioned that. We are a nonprofit, separate 501c3. So you can take a tax deduction if you give us money. So. Right, so if you ask that question, you have your checkbook with you, exactly. you know, use it. There's a pen on the table in addition to the blue forms that where you ask questions. But just make sure you sign your name correctly. Right, Miles? No anonymous. Okay. Um, this question is from Michelle Morales with the Mikva Challenge. Michelle, where are you? Right over here. Um, Excited by all the economic opportunity development and investment in neighborhoods. Her question deals with the gentrification that often follows economic development. How does WBC factor the issue of gentrification into your neighborhood planning and so forth? So great question, Michelle. Obviously critical. Um, it's why I talk. It's why we have the workforce piece that we have. It's why we talk. In fact, we're going to have a fellow this summer working on other strategies for gentrification. I think it is really important. But it is why we have to think about how we skill people and getting people into better jobs. Because look, every middle class neighborhood, every homeowner here, what do we want more than anything else in our neighborhood? We want our property values to go up. Right? Why should, and but the challenge in neighborhoods that have been underinvested in for years, if they're full of people who can't benefit when that happens, right? They're excised from that opportunity. So the question is, what do we do to open that door of opportunity for them? It doesn't mean we don't improve the neighborhood. It means we have to be thoughtful about, so for elders, senior citizens, how do we make sure that we figure out how to maintain their rent prices or their taxes? For younger people, how do we skill them? But it doesn't, it, they don't have to be enemies, right? Because if we don't do that, then we never improve these neighborhoods. And that's, and that's the other reason why it becomes critically important to think about how we rebuild and redraw back in middle class families into these neighborhoods as well. By the way, for those of you who don't know about Mikva Challenge, they get young people very much involved in the political process. Um, I'm involved with the training of uh, election judges here in Chicago for over 20 some years. And probably some of the best judges that we get are people that come from the Mikva Challenge. So thank you very much. Um, final question. <laughs> come on, this isn't that bad. You were so great. I thought someone would have a question. Are you a candidate for mayor in the future? OK. Now. enough of those, don't you think? Yeah, but you have all of these voters in your house. You've got three children. F from what I read, four dogs and three cats, and they all seem to get along. Unbelievable. Okay. This is from uh, Mike Rolfus. He's with Renew Chicago. Mike, where are you? Okay, back there. Congratulations on all of the exciting news. 
as we soon welcome a new mayor, what do you see as the threats to the economic growth that we need to be concerned with? And then he mentions a whole series of things, pension, city income tax, violence, wealth inequality. You know, it's a simple question to answer. 25 words or less. Look, we, we have a lot, we have challenges, and you know that. I mean, the, the single biggest, I think, challenge the mayor's gonna have to face immediately is dealing with the city finances and the pension balloon, right? And how we do that in a way that doesn't push people, drive people away. I think the important thing is to think through the, pol we're gonna have to make policy decisions. We're gonna have to, we're gonna all have to feel some pain. That's gonna happen. The question is, can we do that in a way that is not focused target on one sector um, or industry or doesn't, um, uh, turn the business, you know, this idea that the, the downtown section of the city isn't paying their fair share for some reason. Um, we have to get rid of the kind of those tropes and really recognize that we all have to, we're all going to have to kind of step up to address some of these issues. Um, but I think they are workable. We had big issues, we had had big issues over the course of the last eight, nine years since Mayor Manuel's been here. And I don't think and under Mayor Daley, we got through them generally pretty well. Um, and I think that's what's going to happen. But I do think we have to kind of avoid some of the labeling um, and the, the, the idea that one party is, should be, that one party somehow is benefiting to the detriment of the other. Because I think my, in this city, largely, everybody's coming together. And we need to remember that. And that's the only way we're going to get through these challenges. Thank you, everybody. Let's give Andrea Zappa a great big hand.